viewers will recall that last week we had a panel of two discussing education, partly to mark the education month of September. As you know as well, this month also marks Amerindian Heritage Month. And a couple days ago, I attended an art exhibition presenting the paintings and sculpture of three Amerindian artists, George Simon, Oswald Hussein, and Victor Captain. Even during the course of the exhibition, they have found time to visit with me today to discuss their works and the implications of American art on culture, history, anthropology, resistance, etc. Gentlemen, welcome to Plain Talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. The theme of the exhibition, Silent Witness, what's the message there? And maybe you can say who chose it will we'll probably start. Yeah. I think um, I should start. Um, I chose the, the title for the exhibition. Um, I think somewhere in Wilson, I must have been reading somewhere in Wilson's, um, Wilson Harris's uh, Palace of the Peacock, and I came across that line where he speaks about the silent witness of the, of the forest and the spirits within the forest. And um, when we decided on the exhibition, I thought it would have been a fitting uh, title. Uh, principally because um, I feel there's, there's a lot, lots happening now within the hinterland communities and within the hinterland of Guyana generally, um, which many of us don't know about. Um, I was uh, very impressed uh, recent, with my recent visit to the Rupununi, the North Rupununi region, where I visited um, Lethem and um, then the central Rupununi area of um, Pirara, and then I moved across towards the <coughs> Rupununi River, um, Yopokari, that region. And um, in the savannas itself, um, closest to, to Lethem, about 20, 25 miles inland from Lethem, was a um, rice plantation. Um, that in itself says something for how it might be changing. And um, there was one instance where one of the rivers was blocked so that the natural um, lake could be um, uh, be made and very successfully. That is one thing that might um, affect the, the region. Um, but uh, archaeologically, it's very little known about, um, in the literature, there's very little this said about the archaeology and the big history of the, of the region. Um, what interested me most of all was this Lake Amaku, mm -hmm. um, where it is said that um, Raleigh is, uh, Raleigh said that it was um, El Dorado. But that in itself um, directed me to, to look at the, um, at a canal that might have been dug between the um, the Rupununu River and the Lake Amaku. And um, I know that the Pirara drains from Lake Amaku right across to the Iring River and then down river into the Rio Negro and then of course into the... But apparently it was used um, in the past as a, as a waterway and, and uh, a trading route. Um, so the, the, the savannas itself is, has a very important role. Um, um, what for its... Um, it's the, the wildlife, the, f the flora and fauna of the area, which has been recorded um, in a very, very special book by Graham Watkins, a very nice um, illustrated book, showing the wildlife of, of the area of the region and so on. Um, that's one thing. The other aspects that I think that we, we don't know how much is being done and how much damage might be doing, being done in the, um, in the upper Mazaruni area, in the forested area. Um, uh, by mining and um, uh, how much of our, our cultural heritage might have been lost by all this. Um, okay, uh, we, we'll get to that. Um, it, to what extent um, 
Oswald and Victor, is your work testimony to the silent witness? Uh, as George said, you know, some of these things, they, over the millennia, over the centuries, they have witnessed these developments. To what extent is your work a testimony? Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate that um, silent witness. Um, it, allow, it allows me to understand, which is the fact of being, when you come to the, the rainforest or being in the rainforest or secretive, there is that witness of from then to now, in its own sense, that we witness what is happening around us. And there is a lot of information could be gathered by people who, because of the uh, allowing ourselves to stay into the rainforest, we have a connection with what goes on with the trees and the plants and the birds and animals. So silently, we observe all the different changes like just recently we were told to come when you come to town you have to wear a seat belt you never knew nothing about it. i mean you know you witness something that's happening to you right and if to that you know there is um, people come looking for birds which they have never seen so you're you're the witnessing someone from somewhere want to see what you know and you give off all the information you being the silent person, knowing all of these environmental life, and you share it. And, but then you're witnessing that person and yourself. That's my... Uh, I, I, I smile just now when you said you come to talk and you learn some things. <laughs> you also came and you had to face 15 <laughs> minutes blackout before this program started. <laughs> sure. Victor, what is the message? What is this silent message that you are bringing in your work? to Georgetown in this, um, in this exhibition? Well, for me, the message that I put out is that, like, in some cases, you would find people, like, they would hard to believe something, or you wouldn't see they doing things that you can see. It's just, like, invisible you may not see it or something. So from my point of view, it, it's a good team. And I think it's, <laughs> <All right. laughs> I can't <laughs> go on. <laughs> Joe, think um, if you were to describe, and, and I'll ask the same question of all three of you, um, relax. <laughs> um, what's you have several pieces in fact there are 54 pieces and I do wish to advise and recommend my fellow Guyanese please go down to Castellani house this exhibition lasts until Saturday October 12th every piece is for sale um, pieces are already being reserved so you need to get them there early uh, George, how would you describe your work? And I, I want to ask you this question. You no longer operate in Guyana. Mm, not, Is that correct? That, that's correct. I live, outside, I live somewhere else. The, 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 work, the work that you, you've done here, is this, is this reflective of Guyana or the, your wider experiences? You now live in Mexico? Yes. yes I do. Is it a cross between those two cultures and is there a difference in the culture? Um, yes, there is a difference. Um, there is a cross, um, which is difficult really to bring together. Um, I've only just moved there a year now, but um, what I've experienced in, in, in Mexico in the visual arts is, um, is of course much richer here. They're much what? richer in Guyana? I mean in Mexico than, than here. Um, um, visually, um, there are, you know, huge um, pet, uh, murals, for example. We've only started doing this. Um, uh, Aubrey Williams started it with, with the Tiberi um, yes. uh, Airport uh, murals. Uh, but we didn't kind of continue really in doing it, but we, there, there are some significant pieces on, around, at, maybe at, at, um, at the, I think the National Stadium has a 
has a few. Um, the University of Ghana has a few. Um, but that in itself is, is a technique that um, I think we can develop here. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is um, that Mexico has, has really produced some, some striking um, artists and, and so on. So I've been looking at those and trying to fuse their thinking and uh, the kind of spirituality they brought to their, their art. Um, we have not, um, so we have not really, to looking at another art form there and trying to compare it and to bring that into, 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 into my own pieces of work, it's, it's a bit difficult to, to merge the two. <laughs> Um, so I'm in, the, in, in this process of looking and, and observing and, and learning much more. About so them. would you say your work, all this work, and, and I guess this would have been produced over a period of time. Uh, yes. You've got, what, 14 pieces? Uh, over what time would you have produced? I, I, in fact, I started some of these um, a year ago in Guyana before I left. I started working on them in Mexico, and I found the subject a bit um, difficult because here I'm much more um, involved with the forests and the landscape than, than I'm in Mexico because I live in Mexico City. And um, being in that environment, it looks out of place somewhat. And uh, I think this to me is very important to realize as an artist that my work might be out of place in one one area, but very much in place. And uh, so, having brought them, brought them here and finishing them off here before I, j I spent two weeks working on these canvases and and paper and, and on paper before um, while I was here, um, give me uh, give me the energy and to to and the working in Guyana gave me the energy to to really finish them and to to bring life to them. So it's um, it's a very kind of confusing situation for me to have um, uprooted myself from from this landscape and then going to another landscape. Though you know the the Mayas and the Incas were there, and we can we can associate ourselves with that kind but, of but but it's still culture. very much Guyana. Is it the jaguar, the tree road, the petroglyph? Y yes, I think the the because the south of um, the rainforest is only in, in the south of, towards the Guatemalan border, is is, is um, rainforest area for, in Mexico. Um, I felt very distant from that. Um, the jaguar, however, is a is a is a mythology and um, a very powerful animal throughout of Latin America and Mexico. So that I felt very comfortable with um, working with that imagery. Um, whereas. Again, the petroglyphs, um, which I touched on and which I, I would use from time to time in my work, again, that is, that is again um, very much across the, the country. But the lands, the, the forest and the tree, and those two paintings of the tree root um, was something else that I, that, that I encountered personally in, in Guyana. And I wanted to make a statement about it, about the trees and the grasping roots for, for water and, and for for life, I, I think it was saying something much more than just standing there and keeling over uh, later. Maybe that was the side of message. Yes. Victor, uh, as a young man, George, Victor, you've produced what? You, you've got, um, you've got 20 pieces yeah. of this exhibition. That's yeah. quite a lot of work. When did you start this? Well, I started painting from last year, like February. And from there on, I continue painting as the year goes on. So what, you, you, you get up in the morning and say, look, I will be painting today? No. Is that how it goes? No. How do you do it? Well... What drives a painter? The... I don't know how to express it, but from me, I would wake up in the morning, like see a nice scene or something, and then I would say, well, I would put this on a piece of canvas or create an abstract from other forms and put it as one. And that's what has been your principal influence? Is it George Simon? Uh, well, not is it, is it the community, is it the forest, or is it just a mixture of all of them? Well, it's actually a mixture of all of them. To me, I was at secondary school during that period. And I was just inspired by painting. Saw painting on walls, and it really drives me. 
So from that moment, I was able to reach Mr. Simon, and he encouraged me on painting, so I kept going. You must be proud of your protege. I am, <laughs> yes, which, which one of these 20, Victor, would you say you're especially attached to, you really like? Well, the ones on paper, not the ones on canvas, because it, it really brings out a kind of lettery sheen to the picture or the design. So I would go for the paper ones. Sculpture, that's your forte, Oswald? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay, go on. No, go on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, um, you know, coming to sculpture, the, the significance and the meaning, the whole layout of um, a message that one can send from wood, gold, silver, bronze, diamond, you know, that, that message that you send from material of such, which for me I use the wood because there's awful lot of it in the, in, in the forest. So I can go around and get some of that. Now, I think about um, being a sculptor, um, I'm sending a message through the, these forms and existence. It's like um, making relationship with the rest of the world. Because with um, carving forms, allow it to leave your home, leave your country, and then it brings people back to you and say, okay, I know you. Now, with, with all of these forms that, um, that I have done over the last 20 years or so, um, they, they, they pick the, the life as a child. As, as I grew up, it, it is a form that I learn. It's a direction of a people, of this type of um, culture, create forms resembling, favoring of this, like leper wood, you know, when it comes to these different type of wood, it sends a message into what happened in the past? What was it used for? To maybe a neighboring country, lines of canoe um, building for dugouts. There's different cuts that you use. So my ancestors. And I guess different types of wood you would use. As of course. Of trees. Yes. Yeah. So the, the the type of cut that you have would remind me of my great grandfather digging out a canoe. So all of this is still repeating itself, like from that age, the past, and the future, the present, sorry, and the future is like documenting the past, present, for the future. As a reference of uh, existence of, of, of people, of such. So that, that's my, um, my reason, really. And um, I, I, would, I would even say that I think um, I've been called to do that job. Which would you consider your favorite of these, um, what, 20? <laughs> favorites are, you know, I, I do it for myself, so they're all my favorite. When I feel good in my heart, I think that is, it, it, it really is, is something to, to, to look back at or to have or to marvel. It's, you know, it's like a, a, a therapy, it's like a healing process. So they're all... Um, not only for the Process. artist, but for the, for the audience looking at it as well. Yes. Now, um, three gentlemen, what about female Amerindian art? It does, does it exist in there? Do we have any female art um, sculptors or, or painters? I can't say offhand. Um, the, Burroughs, the Burroughs School of Art has produced quite a number of um, female artists, but if they've excelled, if they've gone the distance, I can't, I don't think there is any that I can think of immediately. Um, is that a societal thing then, that, that females are not encouraged 
to get into painting, into sculpture? Um, females, um, they, they do um, work along um, in canoe building. I mean, they have you know, different stages that you would, a woman will have to come in because there's certain work they can do. Right, they could even get the leaves to burn because you have to bring it from um, there to here, sort of. And even making their own um, beater for washing clothes. So they make different forms like the crocodile head and the handles and, and stuff like that. So they, in, in the environment that um, Amerindian people would live, you'll find women will do something of such, but not to, for, for the reason. That the, to, to be popular about it, but just for their home use. Victor, you, you are from the community in Sarama, yeah. is that correct? Um, are, are there female uh, painters, sculptors, artists? Well, no, not in Sarama, but I think within the Rupununi, yeah. they have female painters, but I'm not too sure about sculptors. How well in the Amerindian communities are the sculptors and the painters respected, admired, um, and regarded as this, these people are sending out our message. Um, in I other think, words, what role do you have? Yeah, I think, yeah, we, I think we've, we've set a, a different kind of mode to this um, the technique of wood carving, for example. Um, like Ozzy said, um, traditionally wood carving would have been a natural thing for you know for, for people for building because here in in this part of the world we use a lot of wood for building for, for structure architectural um, our houses and so on are made from wood the canoe is made from wood the Martin pestle is made from wood and these are fashioned and of course with bow and arrows of course on the other hand. Um, uh, hammocks and uh, and so on made or things made by women. Initially, pottery were made by women, and um, uh, pottery would have been made from women. And weaving and so on would have been women. Uh, bows and arrows and so on would be men. Men's um, uh, forty for making artifacts and so on. But um, our our. Um, because our work is more is not utilitarian, um, it's much more for aesthetic and for sending a message to, to the public. It's it's um, it's a technique. Painting is a European technique that needs to be learned, and of course that is where the art school comes. I said painting is a European technique. Uh, um, the, the, you mean the, the kind of painting. The, the way uh, yes, and the way paint. For example, the the tree. For example, one of the tree roots for example, was um, painted in a way where the paint is, um, is transparent. But these techniques of, of, of painting is, 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 is learned. Um, uh, whereas Aussie, again, uh, the subject that we use is a, is, is a, is a different matter. What we use uh, very old techniques for executing our, um, our art. I myself have looked occasionally um, at art from various um, cultures and communities. Mm -hmm. You notice Mexico, for example, mm -hmm. Peru, mm -hmm. um, South America. Even your colleague, Desmond Ali, yes. he sees art as projecting the history of struggle, the history of resistance, mm -hmm. the history of the, of the challenges. Yeah. Um, do you see the art as playing a role in providing that kind of backdrop, providing that, that oh, information yes, and history. Yes, yes, of course we use we use art, um, the, the Mexican muralists, the, the, the art because they want to take the art to the public and they want to make a statement about, um, about their, their themselves and uh, what is happening in the country. Um, for, for Desmond, of course, he has his own theme and that he works on. For us, I think we deal more with the spiritual aspect of indigenous peoples. For me personally, um, I think spirituality is, is a very important thing that um, has been kept on the ground. Um, it's, been, it's been silenced by, by Christianity and by religion. And, um, but what, what, baff, what, not, what, what um, I'm interested in is how people live before Europeans came in this landscape and, uh, you know, 
This is a very hazardous, the Amazon is a very, very hazardous place to live in, um, in pre-Columbian times. And how did people deal with that? And that, that really kind of fascinates me. And um, to learn about the spirituality and, and so on, it's, it's something that um, I think we, the three of us are really um, a, a touching on in, in our work. Who then, if our Amerindian artists and sculptors pro project the spiritual aspect, mm -hmm. who tells the story of the struggles for survival that Amerindians have had to confront and overcome to be where they are now? Who's, who's, who will be that messenger? Oh, I just want to, um, I think I, I I have a feeling, I think I know the, the, the two um, persons, um, you know, for, for our time is George Simon and Ozzy. You know, to, to leave your home, all that beautiful fish and cassava and sleep in the hammock after a nice cassery. We said, no, we just go up to the front and see if we could make a mesh with the people or put a new dimension into their their lives. And we did this over the years. Right now we have a show at the, one of the top art gallery in Georgetown. And this is breaking the ice sort of to, uh, for the rest of Amerindian people to, not to give up, but just to, to get out here and learn the technique. You can go back home if you wish. So, and you know, they have well, this is our heritage month. They have Stephen Campbell, but they're all gone. But we still remember them. We have a, a, a young um, lawyer over there. You know, we are we are learning the trick of the trade of life by holding back. Because the the point is that you have to know yourself back home before you can Project venture this way. Right? If you don't know it, don't move. You have to. You have to be. You have to learn both sides of the coin. Victor, how how are you learning? This is your first exhibition yeah. in Georgia. Yeah. How are you adapting and, and adjusting and to this? Well, for me, I see it as a step forward. So it would encourage me more, or it encourages me more, to take other step like have exhibition in other areas in Georgetown or even out of the country. So I think it makes me feel like proud of who I am now, an artist, and it will have me doing more and more. So we'll, we'll see more of you, yeah. more of your work and exhibitions. Yeah. I'm going to put this question back to you, um, Mr. Simon, because yeah. you avoided it. The question about resistance um, and, and struggle in among indigenous people, and they've, they've survived. We talk about Holocaust, we talk about mm -hmm. extermination. They came pretty close. In some countries, they, they were completely wiped out. Who tells, where, what's the artist's role in telling that story? I think yeah, we have, we have a, a great responsibility to society. Um, again, we, you mentioned Desmond, and Desmond once, not too long ago, said something about we're not saying enough about what's happening, like, like the um, the recent murders we've been having, and uh, this is this is a kind of thing that's developing now. And um, in fact, I did some uh, canvases um, which related to spirituality, where I touch on the Hindu religion, um, the Amerindian. Um, story of the Uriu, the great snake, the mother of snakes. And um, I touched on some African, uh, like the, 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 the siren and so on, the, the mermaid. I touched on these subjects because after the, uh, after the, um, after the massacre on these coasts, um, I felt something should be mentioned. And I think what, though I saw this a lot- This is the losing man. Losing, after that, I felt, I really felt upset because there's there's a lot of religion and, and churches and and so on that are, that we have on the coast here, and yet there's all this this. Um
vulgarity and murder and everything like that and disrespect to each other. And I felt it should, you know, one should be looking maybe directly, and, you know, askance to what is happening and look at maybe the spiritual side of our, ourselves as, as, uh, as Guyanese. So I, I, I touched on that aspect in, in this way to, sell, to, to send a message that we are not, we can be, you know, we are individual, we should respect each other in this particular kind of way. Um, our break is coming up, yeah. but I, I want to give you two gentlemen an opportunity. Um, what can we look forward to, uh, particularly from you, Victor? What, 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 what are your plans? In, in terms of production? Well, when I return back to my home, I would have like youths or go back and teach them in the way in painting and have them encourage other youths to come out to do some more painting. As well? well what are your plans? <laughs> My plans of, uh, I talk about Guyana, no, we call it, you know, art is part, the word um, Guyana is water, right? So when we come to this kind of thing, I, you know, I, li I like to look at it in a, a wider scale. Like I, you know, I, I in the future that, um, that I, w I would like to see a uh, Amerindian president, I think, and we will, should work with our art. That's the whole processing of, having a direction of a people by such, by our art, would allow it to pave the way for, for the future. Well, Mr. George Simon, Mr. Victor Captain, the youth, Oswald Hussein, thank you very much for appearing on Plain Talk. And I wonder, Oswald, um, I am speaking to another Amerindian just now, and I, I think he has a great political future. So you might you might want to stay back and look at the second half of this program. Yes. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank I, again, you so very much. I these gentlemen, their work, in paintings and sculpture, are being presented at an exhibition, Castellani House. It goes on till Saturday, twelfth of October. I think it's worth your visit. Please stay tuned. Welcome back to Plain Talk as we continue our discussion marking the celebration of Amerindian Heritage Month. And on this segment of the program, we have Mr. David James, an attorney at law, and Mr. Audrey Haynes, who is the CEO of the Indigenous Peoples Coalition. Gentlemen, welcome to Plain Talk. Thank you Thank very you. much. The, it says we are celebrating Amerindian Heritage Month. What, how and what are we celebrating? Tangibly rather than just a slogan. Well, um, we should be celebrating our um, accomplishments as a people, as the indigenous peoples of Guyana, um, our contributions to society, to the Guyanese society, because uh, in my view, we are an extremely integral part of, our, of the society and um, therefore it's important that in this month we we portray and we celebrate those those achievements and, and those contributions but yes you make the point what are we tangibly celebrating and for me i think we ha we're celebrating one that 
um, we have come a, uh, quite a long way since uh, colonial times, since independence, because I like to think of it as Guyana's, uh, Guyana's achievement must be what we have achieved since independence. Um, because for us as a nation, I think that is important uh, in nation building and in cohesion among the, amongst the various peoples in Guyana. And uh, so far, what, you know, it's not as great as I would have liked to, like, like to see uh, as, as an individual. Uh, we have more professionals now. We have uh, artists like the, the persons who you interviewed early on your, your program who are making a contribution to our society. Um, uh, so in various uh, sectors of Guyanese society and Guyanese life, we are making really good contributions, but I think there is a lot more that we need to do. Mr. Well, well, yeah. Um, there, there's lot to, lots to be, to, to be celebrated. Uh, we, have, we have nurses, we have doctors, we have well, probably one lawyer, uh, we have politicians, we have members of parliament, um, a rich culture. <coughs> we have, when we think about the name of Guyana, which, which, which came from um, indigenous, um, we celebrate Mashimani, which, come, which came from indigenous as well. So there are lots of, um, in, in the past, that things we can reflect on. And, and the month of September allowed for that, the reflection. Uh, but as uh, my colleague uh, has said, that there is still a lot more. Uh, when we listen, uh, one of the, the, the primary function of the, of, of the commission is to establish mechanisms that will enhance the lives of indigenous people and to listen to their needs, legitimate needs and demands. And from that perspective, um, if the commission listen as, as it has done over the, the two years that it has been in existence, um, what we have documented, and, and if, we, if we are to discern them to be legitimate demands and needs, we can say that um, truly there, there, there are a lot of things we are yet to, to achieve to, to ensure that the, 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 the contribution that indigenous people make to society is more tangible, beneficial, and impacting. The, the um, cultural contribution, how would you rate that? Um, I, I don't think either you mentioned that just now. How would you rate that thing to the, to the development of nation building? Yeah, well, for, <clears throat> for me, I think the cultural aspect is fundamental because when you speak of cultures, you talk about everything that makes us as a people. And including the art. Including the art, everything, everything. And, um, and that is so much dependent on your environment, on your life, on where you live. And this is so crucial for indigenous peoples because the majority of our indigenous peoples live in the interior, they live in the hinterland. Um, and their culture is dependent on the, on the environment, on the land, on the territory, on the resources that sustain them. And that is why one of the most fundamental aspects of, of our life of it as indigenous peoples is to secure our land and territorial and resource rights. And that is still an outstanding problem today. And that is a very uh, worrying issue and a cause for concern for all indigenous peoples who are concerned about that aspect of, uh, of our life in relation not just to culture but everything that we do. Is that something, um, I know you're not here as, to, to, as a spokesperson for the Indigenous Peoples Commission, but is that something uh, um, Mr. James has raised this issue, the question of land titling and uh, marine rights to, to, to land, is that an issue that has been actively pursued by the commission? Well, yeah. Uh, I must say that culture is, is including the language, is, is what identify a people. And as you know that we have nine different languages in, in, in Guyana. Um, and that is a threat, right? Especially for those um, 
tribes that are closer to the, to, to the coastline. Um, you know, they are fighting to, to maintain their, their, their language as, as a cultural identity. Um, with respect to that and in relation to, to, to land, um, to, to determine the, the, the association with culture to land, yes. Um, the Commission um, has documented over the two years complaints that have come into to the Commission. And I can say that land is the major complaint, complaint about um, land, um, rights to, to the land that, that, that um, they inherit ancestrally or traditionally or whatever. Um, is still a major concern for, for, for indigenous people. So, and the, the, the commission is pursuing that, rightly so, as, as a major concern of, of indigenous people because if we are to listen to legitimate demand and need, land is coming out as that um, legitimate demand and need from, from the people based on documented um, receipt of concerns from, from indigenous communities you know, throughout the length and breadth of the, the, the mostly populated areas of Ghana regions 1, 7, 8, and 9. The government spend, has spent billions of dollars towards the promotion of Amerindian interests education, health, transportation. Um, are we seeing the results in the Amerindian communities of, of all the, the, the money that is being spent on these communities? Well, um, that question is one which probably we'd have to look at very carefully because Money spent, uh, and it could be lots of money, doesn't necessarily mean that at the end of it you have lots of results. Um, uh, no doubt, yes, we can appreciate that uh, lots of money has been put into education, into health, and so forth. And there are some tangible results, if we may use that word, um, of, of persons who have now proceeded to university, um, or tertiary education and so forth. Um, and, and so you have, as I indicated earlier, uh, you have more professionals in, in various fields. Um, you have more children probably going to school at the primary level from, well, beginning from the nursery, nurse, uh, sec and, and secondary. And so therefore in the field of education, you probably have a, a greater number of students but my question has always been, because I've spent some 15, over 15 years in education myself. I'm, I'm a graduate teacher. Um, and I even was, uh, you know, in the senior administrative um, positions within the school where I taught. So, and even now I keep an interest in education, so that's one of the areas that I follow pretty closely. And my question has always been, is it the type of education which really benefits the indigenous peoples? Uh, or is it an education which uh, is geared mainly to take us out of our communities? Or is it one where you, an education which helps to build your community? Well, let me ask Mr. Haynes answer that question, since you've been asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, investment versus um, results, right? No, well, no, no, but I think it's a bigger, a, a more subtle question. That is, is that the, is that a beneficial result? Because you could have results that are very counterproductive, that are destructive. Well, yeah. Um, results fix to, 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 to outcomes and long-term impact, and and if we if we to to, to try to, to measure that, uh, it will require research in itself to to, to determine where outcomes, positive outcomes and impacts are made. Um, you know, but, and I speak to the quality of, of education in, in, in one area, specific area. And if you are to engage people who are intended to be the primary 
beneficiary of, of these investments. Um, I can recall one example where we engage the commission that is engaged 40 young um, secondary school students, right? And you know, we asked, so what are your major concern? Right? We know that you might have many, many different concerns, but highlight one to us. And out of 40 students, right, I can't remember the exact figure, but probably between 8 and 10 indicated that quality of education is of concern to them. They, they feel that the quality of education in that area is of concern to them, um, specifically in relation to, to, to infrastructure is, is another example. They say that, well, they, they no, but we, no, 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 mm. let, let's get this. Mm. I, I, think, um, I think Mr. James's question, mm. are we educating them for, for their own development, or uh, rightly or wrongly, or does the very education, the, the relevance and nature, operate against their interests? As a community as a whole, not mm. not as as okay, you produce mm. a lawyer here, mm. produce some doctors, you produce nurses, soldiers, teachers, well, a the, policeman. Well, the education, in my opinion, and, and that's my opinion. I, I can't say for the commission. The commission no, we know that. Good. But in my opinion, uh, speaks to in, individual. It's what an individual is not probably what um, the in Jesus community what 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 what, what like. Um, the direction in which um, a community, in just previous community, would like to, to, to see probably forecast in probably five years, ten years. Let me ask you this question then, mm. and, and both of you, has any serious study or survey been done, not just taking for the students mm. and asking them, no random surveys, I, I'm talking about a serious mm. study being done as on the the development of the Amerindian and indigenous people of our country. Are you aware of any? I'm not aware of any. No. Um, but shouldn't that be the starting point then, uh, Mr. Haynes? Well, yeah, that, that, that is the reason for my point earlier, right? To understand and measure the impact. And to, so what we would like to happen in the future will have to be based on evidence. And, and research, and, that, and that's why I said that um, what happens from now on forward probably needs an in-depth research of, of what is, and in the, uh, so that you can get evidence to, to, that can help us to point to direction and probably um, areas of need and, 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 and probably professionals that we need to help um, to integrate more indigenous people into society and to have their positive contribution. Just before I, I, I came for this recording, I received an AP and U Press statement, um, and the AP and U said, the press statement, PNC's hinterland policies are hampering development and hindering security. Um, the Ministry of Amerindian Affairs was to discuss the protest. I quote this, as nothing more than an adversary group trying to boost its significance. Is the Amerindian community now in a tug of war and, or, or in a war between rival political combatants on the coastline? Well, I put it this way. I believe that as indigenous people, we have certain issues which we need to be addressed. And certain concerns that we have brought to the fore. Um, I know that they are the main political combatants who would wish to have us in each camp, but that doesn't in itself serve us very well because in doing that, what it does is that, is that we lose the actual message that we want to bring to the public and bring to the attention of the authorities. So for instance, in early August, there was a protest in relation to land rights affecting certain communities. Legitimate uh, concerns that they had. And so if the ministry indeed uh, said that it was just an advocacy group trying to promote itself, that would be 
extremely disappointing because it, it, it means that you have not even listened to what the, the, the people had to say. Let alone understand. Uh, let alone understand, exactly. What's, what's your view when you, when you read this, or when you, now that you're hearing about it? Well, as, as indicated, the Commission has a responsibility to, to, to listen to, to the concerns expressed by Indigenous people. Uh, with a view of establishing... Well, the when they heard now, that the Ministry of, of Armenian Affairs mm -hmm. was so dismissive, mm -hmm. right? and, and I, you, you are speaking on behalf of the Commission now, um, and I was wondering whether you wanted to go down that route, mm -hmm. but shouldn't the Commission have, have acted as a mediator in this? Well, y yes. Um, that being said, the Commission is still in its infancy stages with respect to its, its purpose and mandate. Um, the Commission has, in, 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 in its opinion, developed trust and confidence in the people it, it, it has to represent. Right? And, and it's still in that stage of developing that. Um, no, no, I mean, the Commission was, was informed that, that and invited. And invited to participate. In, in an engagement with, 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 the, with the community, right? And did it? And, and well, it participated, right? Um, but the, the, the commission will record, document this thing, and, and discuss internally and determine how do they react to it, right? And that discussion hasn't taken place as yet. Let me raise some of the challenges facing the community. Well, you, uh, what I think the challenges are, you will tell me what you think about them, how serious they are, and what is being done. Trafficking in persons. How is, is, that a, is that a reality? Does it harm the Amerindian communities? And to what extent? Yeah, well, I, th I think now it's, an, it's accepted. It's a fact that uh, trafficking in persons is, is is an issue that affects um, well not just Amerindian communities, but I think the perception was that Amerindian communities were were more affected or more targeted by the traffickers. Um, and it looks like this should be trafficking in children rather than just. Well, yeah, <laughs> because I think mo in most cases these are minors rather than minors, not minors. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> rather than, than than adults, so. Um, um, to, the, to, to the extent that it affects the community, I think that is a question of how do we determine that? What are the indicators? Um, and all of this requires some research, some, uh, you know, delving into the statistics, into the actual causes and, and, and the, 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 the actual traffic, traffic, well, the traffic children and so forth. And all of that, I think, needs you know, people, someone to, to look at it very closely, and is that, and that is being, not being done. Is that work being done? Uh, it, um, Mr. James has said the work is not being done. Is the Indigenous Peoples Commission doing some work there? Some on, serious on, work? On, on human trafficking? Yeah, trafficking in persons. Well, well no. Um, but what, isn't what, that one of the major issues? Um, would you rank that as a major issue facing the community? No? Well, well, yes. <laughs> it, it's a threat to, if, if you understand what human trafficking is. I mean, my personal knowledge, and which I've shared with the with, with, with commission and, and the communities, um, human trafficking is the second largest criminal activity in the world. How it operates is like drug trafficking. Um, it's not something you can go and just find, right? It requires, right, intense it requires investigation. A, it, it requires a start, though. Yeah. That's the important. Now, what about deforestation and mining? That seems to have become another serious hot button issue for the indigenous communities. That's the impression we get from the from reading the newspaper, the coastal newspapers. Is that correct? Yes, to a large extent. Uh, um, well, the thing is, with mining, gold mining especially, and, and no other forms of mining, but gold mining in particular. Uh, you, you have to clear the, the, the overgrowth, the forest, 
to get to the to the um, mineral on the on the ground or below surface. So inevitably, once you have mining, gold mining, you will have deforestation or forest degradation because in some cases the forest is degraded to the extent that it's not much of a forest afterwards. Uh, it is a, it's a serious problem in, in quite a number of areas, uh, especially in the gold mining areas, of course, and where you have indigenous communities in those areas. Uh, I know under the low carbon development strategy, there should be certain statistics and certain um, um, surveys and mapping which should be done to determine the, the, the exact or, or at least an accurate um, you know, picture of what is taking place. Um, that information is, well, even if it's there, you know, not everybody knows it. And uh, so th I think that is important that the public is, is brought up to date with what is the level of deforestation in relation to, to mining activities and other activities that have impact on the forest. Yeah. Mr. Hayes, so, let me ask you this question about the influx of coastlanders, Brazilians, and now Chinese. What impact is that having? on the communities? Positive, negative, well, neutral? No, wh whatever activities Brazilians or Chinese or even coastlanders make in, in, in the communities um, is determine what the, how the communities feel about, about their intervening in, in, the, in their space. Uh, most of the, the reports and concerns we receive had to do with land, and land titling, land titling in relation. No, to, I'm, I'm to, asking to, specifically. To, I think we've, we've dealt with land mm -hmm. titling that that exists. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about these Brazilians and now Chinese. Mm -hmm. I understand there's some some stores in um in in Letem, for example, in some of the, the, the closed Brazilian regions. Mm -hmm. they, they not um, even the stores are not even named in um in English. Look, the commission hasn't taken a, a, a direct reaction to to to, to those things. Um, and we have not received um, re reports about concerns ab ab about that. Um, albeit, the commission, as I said, has a responsibility to look into to promotion and protection of rights of indigenous people. Mr. We, Mr. Go on, yes. Right? Um, and in doing so, right, we cannot be seen to to be taking over the responsibility of certain ministries and agencies. What, what we can do is advocate for the rights, right, based on evidence from these in, from indigenous what, people. What, what I'm hearing from Ms. <coughs> Haynes is that a lot of these critical matters are not being brought to the Indigenous Peoples Commission. Whose fault is that? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that a lot hasn't been brought uh, or haven't been brought. Um, I think that quite a few have been brought, quite a few cases have been brought. Uh, one of the things that uh, has um, inhibited the commission or been a hindrance to the commission is, is first of all, the, the, the funding to really reach out to these communities. Um, uh, and, and so it's a question of uh, do we have the, the financial resources to, to do our work? And if you may ask the CEO, he will tell you that it's not very adequate. Uh, and, and, you know, and so that is one of the, the setbacks to really getting out to the communities to investigate some of these issues that have been reported to us. The, the, the press, the people, keep, the people come all the way to Jordan. Do you sense that there is a sufficient will on the part of all stakeholders, including the government and its, its ministerial arm, um, that there's really a will to address the, the serious challenges facing the Amerindian communities. Yeah. Well, you, you want to go with that? If, if I may just... We um, just got one minute, <laughs> so you share yeah. it. I, I